In this sequence of videos, we will discuss basic data types in SQL Server and write queries. Broadly speaking, here are four categories of data types supported by most relational database management systems. For us, it is important to have an understanding of the first three. We will touch briefly on large objects, but not cover them in any detail. String types can be variable length, noted by the phrase VAR in the data type name, and can be Unicode or non-Unicode, noted by the presence or absence of the N in the data type name. Fixed length strings consume the same amount of space in your database, regardless of whether they are completely full or completely empty. If you allocate space for 50 characters in a data type and you only store 10 characters, you are still consuming 50 characters in the database. This may be a problem. If your database is excessively large and needs to scale and needs to be enterprise wide and is translating, transmitting a lot of data across the internet or across a network, or this may not be any problem at all if your database is dedicated to a small number of users in a local area. This depends on your application and the, what you intend to do with that database. We can write SQL to insert values into a table. We won't do much of this in this course. I just wanted to expose you to it and show you how easy it is to add a row to a table. When we're adding string values to a table, we put single quotes around those string literals. This is the same thing that we did in a previous assignment when we used a string as a filter when we wrote a select query. There are several numeric data types. Generally, they break down into floating point types, which have some number of decimal places, and integer types, which have no decimal places. They have different uses. A good thought experiment would be, how would you store a zip code in a database? Intuitively, a zip code is a number, but a zip code can be a nine digit number with a hyphen after the first five digits. But a zip code may have letters in Canada, in the UK, and other parts of the world. Perhaps it's a better idea to store a zip code as a string, which accepts letters and numbers if we plan to scale our database across national boundaries. These are just things that have to be considered when you're a database designer, and they're interesting to talk about in an academic setting. Integers are a very commonly used data type to count things, to keep track of how many of something that we have, to tally up someone's age, someone's weight, the speed of a vehicle, the size of a widget, the dimensions of a part that we are making. And it's important to have some grasp of the capabilities of the integer type. In SQL Server, an integer is four bytes wide. As you know, a byte is eight bits. Four times eight is 32. So an integer is 32 bits wide. An integer has a negative range, a negative component, and a positive range, positive component. A maximum value of, if we look at it as just an absolute number, of 2 to the 32nd different values. But we divide that in half. Half of that goes to the negative range, then through 0, then most of the other half to the positive range. We've indicated the range on the slide. 2 to the 31st through 2 to the 31st minus 1, and then we wrote that in base 10, 
2,147,483,648 through 2,147,000 The 7 at the high end is because we used 0 as one of our placeholders therefore we ran out of digits so the negative end is a little bit farther than the positive end and we should put a, a negative sign in here and we should put a negative sign here now we're correct minus 2 to the 31st through 2 to the 31st minus 1 does that number have any meaning to us? It's a very large number in a lot of cases. In some cases, it can easily be exceeded. And let's look at some examples. Looking at the upper end of the range, 2,147,483,647, relative to the current population of the world as of the publish, publishing of these slides, quite a bit smaller. There are 7 billion people in the world. Therefore, it would not make sense, it would not be useful to use an int to keep that count in a SQL Server database. We would already be out of range and we would already not have enough space to keep track of that number. To solve this particular problem, we could look for a larger integer type. Here we are in the Microsoft documentation for SQL Server. This is SQL Server 2017, which is relevant. We see that there is a big int type that goes from minus 2 to the 63rd to positive 2 to the 63rd minus 1. That's an 8-byte storage allocation instead of a 4-byte storage allocation, as we saw with the int we could certainly store the world's population in that number. But as a database designer, these are considerations that you have to think about. What is the proper data type to use to store the information in your table? Here's one that would fit. UC enrollment as of the publication of these slides is about 27,000, well under 2 billion. If we needed a data item in a table to keep track of UC enrollment, we would certainly be well within the range to use an int. Now if we flip back to the slide again, and we glance at the table, we do see that there is a small int that goes from minus 32768 to plus 32767. That only takes up two bytes. But it's generally good practice to use int to store something. We generally don't use tiny int or small int unless we're very, very pressed for space or there's some specific reason. Generally, we put things in integers even if we know they're not going to get anywhere near that large. So were I designing a database to store UC's enrollment? and I noted it was 26,608, I would still resist the urge to use a two byte int and I would still use the four byte int. Generally speaking, a four byte int is going to move more efficiently through the computer hardware than a two byte int and the storage savings of those two bytes is not worth the inefficiency and it's just generally confusing to most people who expect to see data items stored as ints. Again, not a hard and fast rule. There will be situations where you may use the two byte int or even the one byte int, but generally speaking, when in doubt, use int. Here's another example where an int was exceeded. And I don't know if Yahoo, I'm sorry, I don't know if YouTube is using SQL Server. I don't know what their backend database is it's probably something proprietary. But you can see that this video has over 3 billion views, which easily exceeds the capacity of an int. And if you do a little Googling and, and read the history of this, 
not too long ago, within the last few years, the first video exceeded the size of an int in the view count and they had to reprogram YouTube to use a different data type to count the, the number of views. Uh, there are several now that are over 2 billion and probably every day that goes by there are some more approaching that number. So the YouTube engineers had to make a choice. What data type should we use to count the number of views? We can no longer use an int because we have examples of videos that have been viewed more than 2 billion 147 million times. Chances are they chose a, an 8 byte int to handle that value. And if you look back at that table again, you can see that the 8 byte int goes from 2 to the 63rd on the negative side to 2 to the 63rd minus 1 on the positive side. It's roughly 65,000 times bigger than an int. And it's unlikely, he said confidently, that we will have a video watched that many times anytime in the near future. Of course, as soon as I say that, that will probably change tomorrow. Temporal data types, data types that can store times and dates break down into three categories. You can store a date, you can store a time, you can store a time and a date together. What you do, the choice that you make, will be dependent on what you plan to do with that data. If you put it in as a date time and you find yourself constantly extracting it in select statements as just a date or as just a time, you may want to backtrack and break that up in the table design as a, as a separate date and a separate time. If you put it in as a date time combination and you always extract it as a date time combination, then that's probably the correct choice. Again, this comes with practice and you'll get a feel for it the more tables you work with and the more data you select from those tables. If we look at the transaction table in the grocery store database, and now would be a good time for you to pause this video and connect to the grocery store database. Remember, you can find the credentials for connecting to that database on Blackboard under course documents. They are not posted in this video for security reasons. But in this table, I broke up the date and the time into two separate fields. And the reason I did that was because I am generating those two things separately using a simulator program that I wrote. So I, wrote the t I write the time into the row separately from the date and instead of combining them together programmatically, I just put them in there separately. And it makes it more fun for you because you can extract dates and manipulate them. And you can extract times and manipulate them if we combine them together, it really wouldn't affect us that much. We probably wouldn't see any decrease in performance because this is a very small database and there aren't a lot of rows that would bog us down with unnecessary extractions of dates and extractions of time. So it helps us focus a little bit and there's no dramatic reason to change it to something else. Let's look at a little bit of SQL that deals with the date. In this example, we're taking information from the transaction table and we're filtering on a particular date that we think is in that table. Select star from T transaction where date of transaction equals and SQL, Microsoft SQL is friendly in that it lets us drop in a date in quotes single quotes, and it will convert that automatically to a date type. In this particular case, we looked at the design of the table, backing up one slide, and the date of transaction is a date type, no problem. But in our query, we enter a string, and we know it's a string because it's surrounded in single quotes, a string literal, 
SQL behind the scenes dynamically converts that string to a date type. So we don't have to use convert or cast as you read about in the book. There are many circumstances where you will use convert or cast, but in this case it is an implicit conversion. The conversion is implied because on one side of the equal sign is a date type. On the other side of the equal sign is a string and SQL will do that conversion for us. Let's grab this code and copy it and then flip over to SQL Server. I'm already logged in, how about that? I'm logged in using the grocery store login. I can scroll down to the grocery store database. There are all the tables and I can select new query paste in that code that I just grabbed off the slide and I can run that and there are the results that you saw in the slide if you look down in the lower right hand corner you will see there are 34 rows and that's significant to us because we want to know if we got a big result set or a small result set that number is a good key to tell us if we might be on the right track. So keep that number in the back of your mind. Know where to look for it. Always glance at it. If it's an excessively small number, excessively large number, perhaps your query isn't doing what you think it's doing. It's another thing you'll, you'll get a feel for as you practice more. We mentioned then that there is an implicit conversion going on. Let's put something in here that is not a date. That is not a date. Can that be converted implicitly to a date? Now so far we haven't got a problem because the syntax is correct. SSMS is happy with an assignment statement and something in quotes. There doesn't seem to be a problem but when this runs at processing time or execution time we may see a problem. Let's run that. There we go. There's our error. Conversion failed when converting date and or time from character string. Syntactically it was correct. Logically it was wrong. If you get that error then you probably need put a valid date in that string. I just made this date up out of my head, 2017, January 12th. And let's see if there's anything in the table with that date. There are. There's a whole bunch of columns, a whole bunch of rows, sorry, that have the date of transaction is 2017, January 12th. That's terrific. Let's put something in here that we know does not exist. Let's put in 2000. I know for a fact there are no 2000 dates in this table. There you go. The query works. It does exactly what we asked it to do, but there are no results to return. Notice in the lower right hand corner, zero rows. This is probably not what we want. There may be, we may be proving to ourselves that there are no records from that day, or we may have a logical mistake that needs to be corrected. This is what we think about as a sanity check. Does this make sense? Do we know that there should be some records in there from that day? Again, as you get more familiar with your data, uh, and you learn more about what to expect from the results of a query. Also note the star. We ask for star in our select statement. That means we ask for all the columns. We don't have to know what the columns are. SQL Server will tell us that it's all the columns. In this case there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Transaction ID, time of transaction, date of transaction, Store ID, loyalty ID, transaction type ID, employee ID, and comment. Those are all the columns from that table. Let's go back to the slides again. We're on slide 13. 
skip to 14. In 14, we're using SQL Server functions to break up this date into its component parts. We're interested in the year, the month, and the day of that date of transaction field. Let's grab this. Return to SSMS. I'm going to overwrite the query that I'd already written. You can ignore the squiggles. At this point, we haven't told it what database to use, and it's a little bit confused, so it's giving us the squiggles. We can still run this, or maybe we can't. A close look at this reveals there's an extra square bracket in there on the day row. I can just delete that. That needs to go away. And that will solve our problem. There we go. For those of you following along at home, I took that out of the slide. You won't have that problem when you paste this code into the window. We can see then that I have divided up, I have broken up the date of transaction field in the row to year, month, and day. I've also provided the original field for reference. If you look at the results set in the very first row, date of transaction is 2012, January 1st. The year is 2012. The month is January, the day is 1st. Notice also that since I didn't use aliases, the result set is a mess because there are three columns without names and that is less than useless to someone who wants to make use of this query. That's why it's crucial to document what you do, in this case adding reasonable, clear, useful column names for your intended audience. In this case, the intended audience is you and me this query is not going to go any further. It won't be put into a production. Therefore, it's useful to put in descriptive column names that are human readable. If you flip back to the slides again, and you go to the next slide, in slide 15, there are the column names that I added. Copy that. Flip back over paste it in. It doesn't come out quite as neatly. Now I have useful column headings. I have year, month, and day. And I can clean this up. Much easier to read when you break up some of the clauses onto individual lines. And you can see that I use square brackets to delimit the column headings. There, there's two reasons for that. One is that date of transaction has spaces. Therefore, without the brackets, I'd get a syntax error because the spaces would confuse SQL. The other reason is if you look at the second row, the column heading is the same name as the function, as a function in SQL Server. And I don't want to confuse SQL Server into thinking that I'm using a function name here when I'm really using what I want to be a column heading. I hide it in square brackets and that way it just becomes a string. It becomes literal. We don't use the quotes that we use the square brackets when we're creating a symbol name like a column heading. You can get into that habit all the time. If you just wanted to call this F there's no function called F, but I can still hide it in the brackets. And now if you look down at the results set, you'll see that the column is called F. The brackets are just a good habit. We've seen two situations here where they're necessary when we're embedding spaces in a symbol name or when we are referencing a symbol name that could be 
mistaken for something that already exists in SQL, like a method name, function name. But even if that none of those two cases are in effect, we can still wrap it in the square brackets just out of habit to be safe. Let's flip back to the slides again. On the next slide, slide 16, moving on to different kinds of data types. There are ways to store very, very large pieces of data referred to as blobs. The B actually stands for binary, so binary large object. And then there are ways to store very, very long character strings referred to sometimes as clobs. The way we do that is to use the keyword max when we declare the data type. So n vercare max means that that is a Unicode character string that can vary in length but can be up to the maximum size supported by SQL Server. n vercare max. The maximum size, as you might expect, is the upper limit of an integer, which is 2 to the 31st minus 1, which is 2 billion, 1 or 47 million something. And the same thing for a blob. If we want to store a text file, a, a video, a PDF, anything that's not human readable, that's stored in a binary format, we can use a blob. We won't do much of that in this class. I just wanted to expose you to those options. If you are presented with this challenge at work, if your company needs to store very, very large things up to two gigabytes wide, this may be an option for you. There will be some people that will tell you that SQL Server wasn't really designed to do this and you need some other kind of database that's, ex that's specifically designed to store very large items. So consider other options if you're starting from scratch, SQL Server may not be the choice for you when you're dealing with something this big. One reason, just off the top of my head, you cannot index these things. If you have something that's that big, all you can do is store it. You can't use it to create an index, which for the most part is not an issue, but if your database is dedicated to very large items, eventually that may become a problem. On the next slide, we launch into writing some queries together. At this point, then we will stop the video and continue on this slide in video two.